My name is Tim Michaels. Welcome to this version of Wellness Wednesday. I feel really blessed today. It's Monday, October 11th, and I'm here with my peer, Bradley Harmon, um, to have a conversation around our cultural, personal, and current connection with the uh, theory of suffering. Uh, before we jump into that, Bradley, can you just share with everybody uh, what your role is here at um, Trinity Health of New England? Sure. I'm the Executive Director of Mission Integration for the Mercy Market. So um, I'm going to ask you a little bit later on because I love that title, you know, uh, Mission Integration. Um, I tend to think of mission as keeping us to our, our purpose to care for humanity. So one of the things recently through the Catholic Hospital Association was a WebEx and a guest, Dr. Robert Wicks, participated. And it was a discussion around post-traumatic growth and the spirituality of suffering. And I really feel the conversation and the article that he had written really started to question how we connect to suffering, how we view it as put on us or, you know, suffering as normal in life, but how that could impede our, our healing and growth. So what's your experience been like around the culture in the Springfield market, Mercy, Trinity Health and Healing, around that connection to suffering? Yeah, absolutely. I found the article actually uh, really excellent and um, really spot on as we look at, you know, what our colleagues are um, going through through the, through the various ways of the pandemic. When I read that article, it actually reminded me of a, a, a recent conversation I had in the ICU. Um, I was actually just in the ICU doing some rounding and in the center in the center gathering spot, got into a conversation with a group of ICU nurses, and you know, talking about really different things. Um, we weren't, I, weren't necessarily talking about God, weren't necessarily talking about suffering, and I remember seemingly from out of nowhere, one of the one of the nurses says, "You know, I don't think God caused this pandemic," and I remember just just hearing that and just thinking. Wow, she must be really grappling. She's really grappling with this, and and struggling with her own uh, uh, potential grief and how to come to grips right. with, with this pandemic. And um, and it just it really just got me thinking that I, my my second my second response to myself was actually pride that I actually had a nurse that was saying it, that was saying because there's a lot of voices out there that saying the otherwise, right? You don't have to look too far on the internet. To see that this is some somehow uh, kind of um, plague of God, you know, that's been imposed by God. So I was really proud of her um, because in my own journey, um, it, er, in my early years as a chaplain, I remember um, grappling with this myself. You know, um, what? How does this suffering happen? And and I really found that the only way forward was to is to really see a God, which is really an Orthodox God of Christianity, that doesn't cause the suffering. You know, but but a God that actually enters into it with us doesn't cause it, but is there present with us, and and that's what's actually been the been something very insightful. You know, so this concept of you know God wept at Auschwitz. You know, how did Auschwitz happen? Uh, you know, it was created by man, but he but God wept. You know, um, right. you know, in this in this pandemic, God's there in the suffering, and right. um, and that's not always easy, right? Because I think we see. We see a lot of um, we see a lot of grief, and, and the first stage of grief is is denial, right? Denying right. that there is grief, right? Uh, and the second the second stage is anger, right? Um, and so it's really interesting. We do really see a lot of, of stages of grief out in our in, in our um, in our units and in our uh, with, within our colleagues and our leadership. Um, but it's just this. It's this, it's this concept that I think that as we've done, and you and I have participated in these, Tim, right? You can speak to this right. too. Sitting there, hearing these nurses talk, you know, about their experience, right? And you can see nurses, some nurses, right? And I, I think some, or doctors or clinicians, um, that did actually encounter God through this pandemic. Like they did have some sort of encounter of God, and there's, and it and it's and it's and it's those people that, you know, within the suffering, 
you know, we're somehow able to still connect with the presence of God. And I think that as a mission leader, you know, that's the part that I, and, and you know, you and I working in resiliency, that's the part that we actually have the luxury to look at as a faith-based organization. Right. You know, I, I, can, I, I, I can, well, I can, I can share with you because we've done these sessions together. I've been doing them when people allow me to. That's the other interesting thing. So choice and the word allow, you mentioned Auschwitz. You know, Viktor Frankl's work about people giving up their spiritual liberty. I'm going to take a little bit of a translation on those thoughts and just say, one of the things this article Dr. Wicks brings up to handle suffering is to be maybe asking the question, what is God showing me in the middle of this? Are there things that I'm not able to see and appreciate because I've gotten so distracted by my belief or upbringing or teaching about suffering. So I'm just going to look at it a little bit differently. It is very difficult. You taught me the difference the other day between caritas and charity. And caritas, that sense that I'm joining you where you are. I'm not denying my vulnerability or my own grief or, mm. or pain. Mm. You know, pain's inevitable in life. Somebody said to me the other day, mm. suffering is a choice but I choose to place myself with these people and then fight the need to fix them or fix the situation. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. calling, the presence, the I won't leave you, I'm walking beside you on the beach, two mm -hmm. sets of footprints, all those ways that we've tried to explain God's presence is simply to say, I'm here with you. And if you use your spirit, your spiritual liberty, your choice to be open to it, I can show you that there is the dawn of light in the misery of a night. I can show you that the steam is rising from your cup of coffee. You could mm -hmm. experience it. It does not diminish mm -hmm. or take away the trauma, PTSD, or the offense. It mm -hmm. does help me feel connected, and I would have to say almost hopeful to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. But it's been really hard to look at my own story about how I was raised around suffering. And since I was raised in a very European Catholic tradition, you know, God gives you suffering and he never gives more than you can handle. And I will share with you, Bradley, that made sense until one of my sisters passed away and left a 10-month-old baby. And I was taught in third grade that God loves us like our parents. And since I could not imagine my parents doing that intentionally, I completely gave up that notion that God intentionally does things to you. Now. I had to learn how to be a meek and humble man and ask for help with a 10-month-old baby girl, but um, it was surprising when that vulnerability arrived, what other peace and joy came, even though there was that pain. So mm -hmm. that is my journey to unpacking the cultural training. And I don't want mm -hmm. anybody to think that we're trying to challenge their belief. Mm -hmm. I do want to challenge people's commitment to continuing the suffering when we don't need to that there's a hand reaching out to you, whether it's Bradley's hand or my hand, Carebridge's hand, a neighbor's hand, God's hand, there is a hand. And it's, and it's this, the one of the things that's been very humbling, right, is we, as you and I have been, you know, going out in, into, you know, into the, all the departments and into the units is, is as a mission leader, you know, um, I, I don't have all the answers. I, right. I, I don't have the answers, right? Um, and, and, and also to keep a little uh, keep a check on on what I think the answers are, right? So in other words, I remember just recently being down and and doing a reflection at the um, at the 7:30 huddle with night shift and and the day shift gathered together down in the ED. And you know there is this kind of tendency, you know, to kind of call everybody heroes, right? Some sense the fact that people are still here, it's heroic, right? It is. Right. But but people don't want to be called heroes and. And I remember I started out this reflection, and it was it was and I it, it it was the beatitudes for healthcare workers, right? But it starts out with the real beatitudes, blessed are the poor, right? And 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 you could as I was going through the real beatitudes, you know, I could I could see people like, okay, where's the mission guy going with this? Is, is he really just down here reading scripture to us, right? And then I and then I paused after reading three of them, and I said, and I said. But if the, if these were actually written for healthcare workers today, they would also say this, you know, blessed are those who are weeping 
privately in, under, in, in, in corners of the hospital only to put a brave face on so our, that our patients will have the courage to go forward, you know? Um, and, and it just kept going along that line. And I remember looking at, at people's faces as I started saying this, and it was, it was like this identifying with their pain, right? Not trying to whitewash it, not trying to make it go away, not trying to, you know, put hero language to it. But it was this sense of, you know, God, that, that really sense that God is there in the suffering. And, and I had people coming up to me and just saying, we don't, you know, this, you, thank you for identifying. Thank you for being able to uh, be a presence because that's really what we need is just presence. We don't need people to come in and fix it. Um, but just to be that presence was a very powerful thing to witness, right? Because, because, because we become ministers of grace, right? And, right. and then, and then, right. and then all of a sudden, here's the, here's the beautiful part of the person that we might be ministering suddenly becomes a minister to us. Absolutely. Bradley, I could tell you and I could talk about this for the next seven years to come. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to leave people with a couple of interesting thoughts. Um, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one situation where a family member or some good friend has lost somebody, and we always say, what do you need? It is the grace of learning that being present with them, not necessarily with words, not knowing what to do to make it better, but not leaving them, being present with them. Um, the second thing that I heard you talk about is really presence. So being with them, quiet, don't worry. Handle your panic. Don't worry about fixing. Just be present. And the third thing I'd like to commit, if you're willing to share it with anybody who finds this video, is um, your version of the Beatitudes for healthcare workers. I'll make sure to put it at the end. So not just healthcare workers, but I think moms and dads and teachers and firemen and police officers and trashmen, everybody has found themselves weeping in a corner and then putting on a brave face for somebody. So I'd like to leave them with that. And I want to Absolutely. thank you for being a living example of our mission, our commitment to the care of humanity in our community, which includes our colleagues. So thank you very and, much. And, and I, you are welcome, but you know, the thanks goes to you and every, every one of our colleagues that are out there living mission. They may not have a language to put on it, but they're doing it. Awesome. I look forward to making another one of these with you. Maybe it'll be a year long project. I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.